Hi everyone, my name is Josefa Dominguez. I'm a physiotherapist. I'm coming to you directly from Brazil. And yes, I am here on work, as you can see from my non-tan. Um, and I hope you're all having fun already in the EPDA meeting, which I am sadly missing. Um, but uh, technology has, has really facilitated that we have this moment together. So I would like to discuss with you a topic that, of course, I'm very close to and very passionate about, which is exercise. But I'm not going into too much research depth, just brainstorming on problems that we might have in this area. So I would highlight one that I'll identify at this moment, which is actually a good problem. Because when I started working with Parkinson um, about 15 years ago, and uh, there were absolutely no options. So, um, and now what we see is just this explosion of what we call non-pharmacological options. So you have the physiotherapy, you have the hydrotherapy, you have the yoga, you have the soccer, you have the dance, you have the boxing. And now the question is, why is this, how do you choose? How do people choose um, with all this on, on their plate, right? So, and then the ultimate, the, another question is like, why do you have to choose, right? Why wouldn't there be just a simple answer to it? And the why is really re represented here by how Sarah Rigo, a person living with Parkinson's in a very young age, how she represents how her care is uh, throughout a year. And so what she's sharing with us is really that she, she spends an hour with her neurologist, and then she might spend about 15 hours with her physiotherapist if she has access to her. <laughs> and then she will have all the rest of the time of the year in what she calls self-care. So self-management, self-care. Um, and this is particularly important. So that means that people with Parkinson need to acquire the maximum knowledge they can so they can make informed decisions. And there was an, a particularly interesting study that was run by the National Parkinson Foundation with a sample of 190 people with Parkinson that were followed for 20 years. And what was interesting to see is that after 20 years of having Parkinson, 47% uh, of the people were actually doing physiotherapy and 54% were actually doing some form of exercise in their community. So it's interesting to see it's not a question of time and then the, the neurologist will eventually refer you to a physiotherapist. It's um, we are still trying to organize this care and, and we have to all brainstorm together in order to get to the right cueing to it. So and then jumping on to all these exercises that are exercise programs that are coming out in the community, right? So you have like the Nordic walking, you have the dance, the dance more more popular and more research for sure. And then you have like the hydrogenastics and etc. Right? And of course the boxing that everyone is is becoming really popular, right? So now the, the, the question is really how how can we choose? Now wouldn't it be nice if we could just have an exercise pill? And here's your 150 milligrams of, of exercise for the week. And, and that's over, right? I think for uh, the people that really don't like to do exercise, because I, I would divide the world into in, in the world of Parkinson into two, right? So it's people that, that are already doing exercise. They, need, they have specific cares and decisions to make when, when coming to exercise and people that don't, right? So if you're not doing exercise, this would look like a really uh, good option. Uh, to just keep your life simple. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's not available yet. So we do have to reflect on, okay, so what are we going to choose and uh, which gym is better, which program is better? And you you will often hear, and I think this probably will happen ongoing, uh, even a neurologist, your doctor, saying, oh, okay, any exercise is good. I've heard this often. And what I'm asking you is like, if you could do specific exercise, why would we choose non-specific exercise? So if there is a way for us to do something better, to address specifically our problems that we have with Parkinson, why would we be doing something that's specific? And, and I think that is worth reflecting. Again, if it's someone that spends the whole day on the couch, if you're comparing it to that, then anything is good, of course, right? So I think it's it's just who we comparing it to, and what people really want from a program. If I got diagnosed with Parkinson's, what I want is something that will challenge, that will address the problem that I'm dealing with. 
And that will help me actually keep expectations real in terms of the exercise and keep my motivation ongoing for exercise. So I think in the long run, it's very important that you that we have real uh, expectations about that the exercise is helping us. What does the research tell us? I mean, of course, we have to always guide our decisions by the research. And there is enormous um, research coming on about exercise, all sorts of exercises. Every single week, it has uh, literally exploded, especially because of the relationship between potential uh, neuroprotection. Um, but I didn't want to bring a presentation where I would be talking about the benefits of exercise for you. So I'll summarize it to this. Um, we, what we need, our best evidence at this moment, is the aerobic physical activity component of exercise, right? And this comes to about 150 minutes of exercise per week, right? And so, and this can come in different forms. Aerobic exercise, you can have examples that I put there, like walking, jogging, swimming, boxing. It's just something that really raises your heartbeat, right? And that you are able to slightly talk at the end of that activity. Now, what we know is we can have research, and then the application of this research to real life sometimes is not that easy. First of all, because we must really be able to see what we, what we know, what the research is really showing, and then that there's a lot of questions that we still don't know, and then cross that over into applying it to uh, clinical practice or uh, community practice. And the people that, that usually participate in the studies are not usually the people that I get in the clinic. So it's really hard to, to really implement directly, and every research um, study has to be applicable, right? Adjusted. So it really comes back to, is this all good enough? Shall we stick with that? Any sort of exercise, as long as it's aerobic and you're doing it. I, I wish I was here to ask you who agrees with this, so I could see the hands going up in the air. Um, but I will take that no one would put their hands up in the air, that you would agree. And let me challenge you to, for us to think together. So let's think about a little bit about what Parkinson brings. So unfortunately, we have, we have the characteristics, which is small movements. So if we have small movements, and here we, the rationale would be, what do you think we need? So we need big movements. We'll probably need to fight it with the opposite, right? So big movements, which is really represented by the amplitude of the movement. On the other hand, we have slow movements. So if we have slow movements, we also eventually have to train some sort of fast and increased speed, challenge the speed to become normal again, right? Then we have overall fatigue is, is um, I would say, a complex uh, symptom because it, 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 inquires, uh, require, it includes a lot, uh, not only motor and, non, and, and also non-motor feature. But I would say that, of course, one of the, the, the ways we have to, to fight against it is to really have some activity and some aerobic components, right? Then I think one of the most challenging uh, symptoms would definitely be uh, what we call postural instability, so uh, feeling unbalanced. Balance is, uh, is a challenge for all of us. And, and so, of course, we must think about having a reaction and stepping uh, movements. Not only the motor problems are, are there to, to bother us, but we also have now the, the very well, well, progressively more well-known non-motor symptoms of so the attention and the cognition, which is a very powerful word, with, of course, that means that we also need to have this cognitive component, right? The depression and the apathy means that we have to have it all, we have to make it also enjoyable so that people can, can incorporate it better, right? So I'd say think about what we have and then how we can fight against it. I do want you to be able to memorize this and in a very easy way so that when you are doing exercise, you can think about this. So I know you just probably just had lunch, so this won't cause you any kind of hunger, but I'm going to use an example of let's create a pizza. So which would be the essential ingredients if we wanted to create an exercise pizza. So I would say the baseline of the, of the, of the pizza would be the amplitude, 
and you have lots of programs like the Lee Silman Big program and the Amplitude programs that have highlighted the benefits of using this type of exercise. So having the amplitude, then what we need next, our tomato sauce will be the speed. So it, when we can guarantee the amplitude of the movement, then we challenge people to increase the speed. We know that by increasing the speed, the amplitude will probably reduce. So we have to keep that always cute. And then when you have these two together, it becomes aerobic. So if I'm doing something really big for a long time, it will, I can enter into fatigue and tiredness, right? If I'm sitting and standing, it will become aerobic as well. If it's a, Besides the amplitude and the speed, the quicker I do it, the more aerobic it becomes. Then there is another ingredient that I want to call particular attention to. Um, I'd say it's the new kid on the block in terms of exercise, which would be adding in the cognition. And now, I don't think anyone eats pizza without the cheese. So this one is really, really important. And I would say cognition, of course, is a scary word uh, for everyone, for us to be able to talk openly about it. And it's really very specific things about the attention, the capacity to divide your attention between one thing and the other. And uh, so this is uh, the multitasking of and the, the being able to reach to the chair and making the right calculations in order to sit uh, adequately. So stuff like that. And we think about how does, why is this cognition so relevant, right? It is reflected in everything we do during our day. So I will give you examples that have been reported by people with Parkinson in a research study as well, but on daily practice we hear this often. So someone that is walking and then has feels the need to stop walking to be able to talk. Again, I wish I was there to ask you how many of you do this, but it's like you're, uh, there is a direct effect about you start slowing down to be able to talk, or your talking gets faster so that you can get it over with, I would say. Uh, but a very common one that you don't even have to have Parkinson for this. You get up from your couch and you walk to the refrigerator and then you get there and you forgot what you went and get. So this is a very common one. I'm sure everyone would raise their hands for this one. But uh, what really happens there is that probably on the way you really started thinking about something else. So you focus your attention on something else once you get to the, to the fridge. Okay, what was I coming here to do, right? So you have other examples that have been reported like lowering your cup before before answering, so you're talking with someone. And this is particularly seen mostly by the, the care partners that would notice these slight changes, because of course, if you notice it with Parkinson, you wouldn't do it, right? Um, so I'd say when you, you think about the posture, which is a very interesting topic, it's like, oh, he's never upright. If you are doing an additional task, your posture will get worse. It's usually because people are talking or very engaged in the conversation that the posture becomes worse and worse. So the real relevance of this, at least that has all health professionals very concerned, is the impact that this cognition has over gait and falls. And so walking, um, usually under situations of dual task training, has been identified you know, as reducing the speed, the step length, increasing uh, the gait variability, uh, the possibility of, of having more freezing episodes, your feet getting stuck to the floor. So that increases the risk of, of falls. Uh, this type of problems is already seen in the beginning of the diagnosis. So there's a lot of people that tell me what took me to the doctor was because I wasn't moving my, my right arm as they were walking or someone noticed that they weren't using their arm. So, but there's nothing wrong with the arm, right? So if you really focus on the arm, you can move it. So you can see there's an influence there of a cognitive decision of not, not engaging with the arm, right? Uh, this is not, this, these are all problems that are not easily perceived by people with Parkinson, uh, because of course you're focusing on, on one of the tasks, so the other secondary task, so-called, uh, becomes, has less um, uh, importance to you, right? Then we also have like a greater uh, variability as well of your cognitive. So if you maybe if you say something in standing position and then if you say it in sitting position, you will see that you'll probably be able to evoke and find the words quicker if you're sitting down. What is 
the solutions that we have recent for this for this problem. What we have, we can have like cognitive training. So it's there's there's uh, also a lot of research coming out in about how to use you know the cognitive games to to really increase uh, what the brain power and uh, and then you also have the effects of the motor training that how exercise also influences cognition. So these are two great areas that are that are really uh, also growing a lot. And then a new a new I would say line of intervention at this moment is really called the motor and cognitive dual task training. And you will probably hear more and more about this because it is becoming really popular, which for me is really the combination of being able to, I would say, mimic real life. Because I can either train you to walk, I can train you to talk, or the speech therapist could be talk, teaching you to talk. But in reality, when you use walking and talking, that's what you do in real life, right? So I wanted to give you an example of this type of task and what it makes and when does it make sense, right? There's a lot of questions around this and of course we use it in, in particular situations. There's some research that came out that really showed that maybe people with that are more impaired and have more difficulties probably will benefit less from this type of training. But here is someone that is 92 right now. And what he's doing, he's, he's alternating spelling out two words where one word is spelled out with his left hand and then with his right hand. And then I take away the words and I ask him to do it again. Now, the goal of this is really to be able to challenge this person to train sitting and standing in an engaging way. And of course, to also problems happen at home when he's, just, he's trying to get up and he's distracted by anything else that's happening in the environment or the phone call or the wife is talking to him. And so this is how we try to mimic a little bit of what's happening in, in daily life so that we can train it and enhance uh, this, this type of problem or reduce it, I would say. So I would say that this area is just so that I, I can give you also some I would say hope that it that it's growing. It it initially was highlighted in 2008 as a first pilot study on this multitask training in GAIT, um, and then it, there was a, a switch in the European Physiotherapy Guidelines from before we used to say don't do it, teach the the people that you treat with uh, telling them not to dual task, and now a switch to okay we have to train this we can't run away from it this is real life. And now recently, uh, uh, randomized control trials are being done with this type of practice. I must highlight that it's not like something that you can just grab onto and just do whatever, because there are a lot of questions that we don't know. There is a frustration levels that we must be concerned about. There must the risk of balance issues. Uh, all the therapists, we are, we are now thinking about how, how can I assess this? How can I incorporate this in what I already do? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that are coming out in, in this area, but it's very enthusiastic to see that there's a hope of something, right? I would say now that uh, there is another ingredient that I wanted to add in. And this is all based on experiences that if you are not having fun, learning is compromised. So I would say that if we could be able to, and this is where I think enjoyment could be the the part each person will decide what enjoyment is for herself right so this is where you can select what what type of enjoyment uh, some people like to hit others and like in boxing and they have a lot of fun with that uh, some people like to be helping others and they engage in an exercise because of that um, so I think that this is the the individuality of of each person but and so it it, it can be all of uh, it can be anything that that you really want to add in that will make it fun and I would say our pizza is more or less complete. I would definitely eat this right now. I do want to give you some examples of how maybe a complete pizza might look like. And this is an ex and I'm bringing this example on purpose because you will be doing a similar exercise right after I talk. And so you can see that. Give it a chance. Try it. Five, four, five, six.
Okay, then I wanted to give you another example, which was actually, and you can see these type of activities where we can add in all these ingredients, uh, maybe in a, like boot, boot camp types of activities. So this was actually uh, one of the activities that we did uh, in Manchester. You know, so it's really close by to you guys. I have one Portuguese in the middle of the group that went with me, which is the Delta. There she is again. And uh, what I'm challenging everyone, and I'm saying like, okay, there's no rules. I just want no one to fall, of course. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm gonna focus on people that might have more difficulty, and I will be spotting them. So I'll be close to those. And what we want to train is like negotiating decision making and confusion in between maybe traffic jams and stuff like that, I would say. Uh, subway handling, changing directions. And what they do when they're going from one a wall to the other, on one side you have letters and on the other side you have numbers. So they have to go through the whole alphabet A1, B2, 3. Okay, so I wanted to give you another example of. Um, of how we can combine it, even in a modality that's becoming very popular, even though it doesn't have a lot of research, which is boxing. And so imagine like every person is very engaged in, in the activity and not working in circuits. I think there's a, there's a difference. Each one of them has a number to it that I'm saying one and four, please come in, three and five, go out, and so on, right? So for the sake of time, of course, dancing, would be also a very good example of how we can make it complex and how we can add in all these components of amplitude, of speed, and of course of, of all the, the cognition, keeping focused on what movement is changing. We have other examples, like obviously uh, things that are coming out new, which is the the, the use of cycling and uh, a recent study came out that really showed the benefits of probably being able to delay the progression of the disease using cycling and so maybe if we can combine other activities in the cycling we we might be adding on until research just catches up right? now I do have to leave you there are so many examples that I could give you and some some of these things you are going to try out today and so I did I did want to just say so just go try it now um, and I have asked Katerina to take it softly on you so I do have your bags here and I wish you all good luck and I really hope you enjoy the event.